that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that, believing, you may have life in his name. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. As soon as the Easter season, Paschal Tide began one week ago, the Church cried out in joy in all her liturgical prayers, Alleluia, an expression of joy. Throughout Paschal Tide, the Church shows her joy by multiplying the Alleluia, the cry of gladness and felicity borrowed from the Liturgy of Heaven. She had banished it during Lent in order to manifest her sadness and to communicate in the sufferings of her bridegroom. Now that Christ is risen, she rejoices with him. She takes up again with new fervor this joyous acclamation wherein is summed up all the ardor of her feelings. The text chosen by the Church for today's Holy Mass all reflect the joy with which we celebrate the resurrection, the very fact of the resurrection, the connection of the resurrection to our faith as its strongest proof. Everything today speaks to us of faith. Blessed are they that have not seen and have believed. It is the foundation and root of all justification. It is by a living faith, the conviction of the divinity of Jesus Christ, that we live the divine life. It is by faith that this divine life begins. Those who believe in his name are born of God. Whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. Who is he that overcometh the world? but he that believes that Jesus is the Son of God. This intimate conviction of the divinity of Jesus Christ makes us throw ourselves at his feet, like the man born blind. The just man liveth by faith. He that believeth in me, although he be dead, shall live. It is precisely by this faith by which we identify ourselves in some way with Jesus Christ, in our thoughts, in our desires, in our words, in our actions. Then comes to pass, as expressed by the Abbot Columba Marmion, the I live now not I, but Christ liveth in me. I live in the faith of the Son of God who loved me and delivered himself for me. In short, faith is a condition for the supernatural life. Over a century ago, Bishop Vaughn wrote that it is a magnificent privilege to be a Catholic. The true faith is one of the grandest, greatest, and most sublime gifts of God to man. It is a gift we can never be sufficiently grateful for and which we can never value too highly, or indeed half highly enough. But, like every other gift, it carries great obligations. It makes those who possess it doubly responsible. They have to watch over this inestimable treasure, cultivate it, to make it bear fruit, to trade with it, as the scripture says, not to bury it in a napkin. We have no reason to treat the faith as if it were a charm or a talisman that will work its marvelous effects of itself and independently of our own personal efforts and cooperation. No, our responsibilities increase and grow in intensity with every additional grace and favor we receive. To whom much has been given, of him much shall be required. Then continued this good bishop, describing and defining divine faith. I know that China exists and India and Japan. I know that Caesar 
was a great man, and that he wrote certain books, and that Napoleon was a mighty commander, and was taken prisoner and died at St. Helena. I know further that the earth turns on its axis, and that the succession of summer and winter is caused by the revolution of the earth round the sun. How do I know these, and countless other similar facts? I have acquired them by no personal industry. They all come to me on the testimony of other persons. I accept them without hesitation and without doubt, but simply and solely upon authority. Now, the acceptance of a statement upon the authority of another is what is called faith, and the character of that faith will vary with the character and reliability of the authority invoked. If the authority be human, then faith is simply human faith. If the authority be divine, then the faith is divine faith. Hence, we may define divine faith to be the acceptance of any statements on the authority of God. In the Creed, we profess that Christ did rise on the third day after his death. He rose most beautiful, with a glorious body. He arose immortal, never to die again. And the good and simple catechism shall explain to you he rose from the dead to prove that he is God, and to show us that we too shall rise on the last day. Through faith, we come to join ourselves to the life of our Lord. It is through faith we participate in the graces and merits he achieved through faith. Through faith, we too partake in the joy and happiness he possesses. Therefore, faith, then, is a virtue by which we firmly believe the truths which God has revealed, made known to us, through sacred scripture and tradition, safeguarded and explained by the magisterium of the church. Faith is a holy habit of believing in God and all he teaches. We should believe all the truths God has revealed. We should believe them without doubting and also live up to them, that is, do what we believe. St. James says, A faith without works is dead. By good works we show that we have faith. Lastly, the special motive for this supernatural faith can only be, and only is, that we believe in God's words because God cannot deceive nor be deceived. This is quite the important point the correct understanding of the doctrine of justification, the depth of the Catholic understanding of faith, and our correct adherence to it. In fact, I know of more than one convert, both from atheism and from Protestantism, who have become Catholics with a happy eagerness, precisely because these truths are so clear in our dear Catholic religion. Regrettably, most of the time we pay little attention to the ardor with which we believe in God. Now, faith is not a sentiment or a feeling. We should already know this well enough. Faith is more of a cold conviction. I wish to strongly urge you in making frequent acts of faith, hope, and charity. The three theological virtues are the highest because they have God directly as their object. Yes, the more acts of faith, hope, and love we make, the more we will please God, and the more our faith, hope, and love will be increased in him, by him, and for him. St. Paul said that without faith it is impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and is a rewarder to them that seeketh him. 
Amen, amen, I say unto you, that he who heareth my word, and believeth him who sent me, hath life everlasting, and cometh not into judgment, but is passed from death to life. Having the correct faith, shall grant us the right understanding of the miracle of the resurrection, where we see Jesus Christ stamp another final proof to his divinity and to everything he taught us. By faith we come to correctly understand him, and this faith is necessarily the foundation for charity. Now charity and love cannot exist. If this correct and right faith is lacking or in the least bit defective, Charity can only grow and exist upon the foundation of faith and hope. It presupposes these two. Finally, it is by this faith that we will find true joy and happiness in knowing, loving, and following Jesus in following God. The Alleluia that the Church unweariedly repeats in the liturgy, and we also in our hearts, during the 50 days of the Paschal season, is like the ever-renewed echo of that prayer which, which she ends Easter week. Grant us, we beseech thee, O Lord, ever to rejoice through these Paschal mysteries, that the continual work of our regeneration may ensure to us perpetual joy in heaven. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.